And thank everybody for joining me and uh, kicking off our inaugural Ilkley seminars. Uh, so without further ado, since I've already been introduced, I guess I'll just jump right into it. Um, now, this presentation is an abridgment of a longer paper that I've been writing, uh, one that I actually have to resubmit uh, probably this week would be the best idea. Um, so I'm not going to focus on everything that's occurring in that paper, just going to stay uh, focused on a smaller idea in this presentation, okay? So as it's already been introduced, we're looking at uh, metaphor. So metaphor processing and interpretation, Grice, and what I would call the psycholinguistic strawman, and I hope that becomes clear as the uh, presentation unfolds. Is uh, the volume of my voice okay? Everybody in the back can hear me. I might be a little muffled, I imagine, but I'll try and enunciate, not speak too Canadianly, okay? Awesome. Okay, so these are some uh, talking points that I'd like to discuss today. So we're going to begin with just a simple introduction to metaphor, um, just to introduce those of us who haven't studied it as long as I have to, to the topic, okay? We'll talk about Grice and his contribution to a theory of metaphor that is a pragmatic theory of metaphor. Uh, then we'll be looking at how Grice has been interpreted recently, more recently, by uh, psycholinguistic models, okay? And this is where that, that straw man is going to come in. We'll look at neurophysiological studies on metaphor that I think support a more charitable reading of Grice. I'm going to try and provide this sort of uh, psycholinguistic model as an emendation to the critical model that has been put forth by psycholinguists. So I think there's a way that we can reimagine Grice, right? That doesn't fall prey to the, what I would call the straw man, all right? This, this sort of caricature. Uh, and then we're going to look at the two-way relation between theory and praxis. So we'll look at what theoretical models can help us do with our empirical uh, models and what in terms of empirical models, uh, how they constrain our theorizing. Okay, just briefly uh, on that. Afterwards, we'll field some questions. I understand that I have about 40 minutes, 45 minutes to speak. Okay, good. I'll talk very slowly because this presentation is not long. Just teasing. Okay, uh, so what is metaphor? It's a very good question, right? It seems like it's something very intuitive. Uh, we, we use it every day in discourse. It's actually one of the most commonly used figurative tropes uh, employed in everyday parlance. Um, so it seems like it's a pretty settled question, right? We have, we have a solution to the question already. We have an intuitive understanding. Now, when I was in my undergrad, uh, one of my exasperated friends, when we were doing our... Um, we were studying for our comps, actually. So we had these in our undergrad. He had said to me that for every solution, a philosopher has a problem. So what we're going to do is try and problematize what's happening with our intuitive understanding of metaphor. Okay? <clears throat> so it's been defined in numerous ways, metaphor, that is. And in fact, it's something that goes back to the ancients, of course. We can start with the Greeks on this. And Aristotle was probably the first to give a, uh, a more systematic treatment of metaphor. <clears throat> so he begins by understanding metaphor uh, not simply as this sort of comparison between words, but an exercise really in analogical reasoning. It's solving an, anal an analogical equation effectively, okay? So here we have uh, Aristotle's uh, definition of metaphor. Metaphor is the substitution of a strange term either transferred from the genus and applied to the species, from the species and applied to the genus or from one species to another, or else by analogy. So we have these four ways in which we can understand metaphor. So we've started with this very intuitive understanding. Most of us employ metaphors quite regularly in everyday speech, moving on to something a little more complicated, right? It's at least four things now, we're told. All right, so let's try keeping tabs of these. Uh, he does go on to highlight, however, and kind of uniquely, uh, since this is going to be something that's denied in the, uh, in the medieval period, in the, in the um, late early modern, okay? And that's this particular quote here. By far the most important is to be good at metaphor. For this is the only one that cannot be learned from anyone else. And it's a sign of natural genius. The true genius is what he says, I think, is a better translation. As to be good at, at metaphor is to perceive resemblances. Resemblance in some things that, uh, that most people seem to be lacking. Excuse me, my mask just keeps falling down my face. Okay, 
So what he's doing here is he's giving us both a definition, but he's also highlighting what metaphor does, what it's used to do. Now, what happened was that he had been speaking about metaphor sort of rhetorically. He has two places where this occurs, and this is in the uh, poetics and the rhetoric. And this sort of displaced metaphor and talks of, uh, and talks of um, simile and metaphor, particularly from the realm of discourse, and sort of just tossed it into the trash bin of rhetoric and rhetoric studies, okay? So it's sort of relegated metaphor from the sort of high position that he's held it. We'll look at another definition here. Uh, this is coming a little more uh, recently, 2008. Yeah, now he would say that metaphor is the juxtaposition of two superficially unlike elements in a single context, where the separately understood meanings of both interact to create a new perception of each and especially at the focus of the metaphor. So there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm not gonna do it all for us. Today. But there's a lot going on. We have two distinct elements now, and we have some sort of mapping or inter interaction the word is being used between these two things, which reshapes yet a third element here. We have a focus, right? Something the metaphor is about. It also alters our perception. So we see that even still today, we respect the sort of Aristotelian notion that metaphors are powerful communicative tools. Even more recently, uh, Ritchie argues that a metaphor is defined as seeing, experiencing, are talking about something in terms of something else. And in the uh, Aristotelian tradition of being a great systematizer, he has sort of kind of plucked different definitions of metaphor uh, throughout the course of research and kind of blend them all into one here. Okay, so what we can, the take home from this is that we're talking about something in terms of something else. We can even go so far as to say that we're thinking about something in terms of something else, okay? Now, this wasn't always the sort of reception that metaphors had. <clears throat> in the 17th century, we have uh, one of the early moderns, John Locke, uh, who would have said that metaphor is a happy extra trick with, of words, right? It's ornamental, and it's orthogonal to discourse, right? It's not important, effectively. So he says here, uh, and this is kind of ironic, so I hope we pay attention, but yet if we would speak of things as they are, we must allow that all the art of rhetoric, besides order and cleanliness, uh, uh, clearness, all the artificial and figurative application of words eloquence hath invented offer nothing else but to insinuate wrong ideas to stir the passions and thereby mislead the judgment and so indeed are perfect cheats. Right? That's a pretty negative review. I wouldn't like my girlfriend saying that about me. Be terrible, huh? Ironically enough, right, elsewhere in this essay on human understanding, he says, let us then suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper void of all characters, without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? Whence comes it by that vast store which the busy and boundless fancy of man have painted on it? Seems sort of ironic, right? Let me explain why. There's at least four metaphors he's employing in this particular argument that he's making concerning tabula rasa, right? The blank slate. So before we have this picture of metaphor as being this perfect cheat, we have to stay clear of it. We shouldn't be employing it. Here we go. Well, he's at least using four. That was the, where you guys laugh at the irony. Ha <laughs> ha, John Locke. No, okay. We'll move on. So just to show you that there's been some different reception of metaphor, yet what this attests to is either explicitly or implicitly that metaphors are important in discourse and perhaps cognition. They certainly make really good rhetorical uses of speech, right? Now, metaphor has been something very difficult to define. We've looked at a few different definitions as to what metaphor is and to the point of metaphor, and we haven't really been able to settle on anything. Um, and that's okay, right? Sort of like a, a concept that doesn't have any firm boundary. Uh, typically, what we do conventionally is identify pragmatic examples, paradigmatic examples of, of metaphor. So we can, I'll offer some of those to you as well, just so we can get an idea, right? But I'd like to just have taken you through that to place metaphor in the historical context of the research that's been done. Uh, now, metaphor itself has been uh, definitely received more attention uh, in, uh, in recent times. And this is because studies have now shown that it sits at the intersection of so many different fields, right? It sits at the intersection of literature, language, communication, uh, people who are interested in philosophy, formal semantics, pragmatics, these sorts of things. 
uh, cognitive scientists, right? So it sits at the cusp of language and, and, uh, and cognition, effectively, right? And so we've been paying a lot more attention to it in recent years. And so this is something that I've been engaged in. Uh, this is the metaphor research. So because it's hard to pin down exactly what it is, and in fact, I'll, uh, I'll let you know a little secret, we typically uh, define metaphor by giving a theory of it in advance, right? So uh, any definition of metaphor pretty much comes equipped with some sort of theoretical uh, under, underpinnings to it that we should probably try and exploit before we start accepting the terms. So here's a list of paradigmatic examples. My lawyer is a shark. You'll hear these sorts of phrases in English commonly, okay? My lawyer is a shark. My job is a jail. Um, here we take this, uh, the last one from Aristotle, who was talking about uh, the Athenian leader uh, Pericles. So um, Aegina is the eyesore of the uh, Perius, right? And here we can see that sort of communicative and rhetorical power of metaphor. It does a lot, right? There's a lot going on in this one sentence here. So it's presenting a bunch of properties or chunks together. Is the eyesore. Uh, it's a place in, in Greece. It, it was a port. Yeah, it was a, it was a Greek port. Well, it still is, but it was also a Greek port. Right, so there was this, so Pericles uh, wanted to decimate this, this, this place effectively. And so, it to, and, and so to convince people of that, excuse me for assuming, I, my, my apologies. So to convince people of that, he, he said that this place was an eyesore, right? Something ugly or hideous. So what this does is it, it uh, ugly or hideous. Eyesore. Is, does everybody understand? Does the metaphor go through? And, yeah. Yeah. But, perfect. Good. We'll, we'll explore this as the, the metaphor. This is wonderful. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so a, an eyesore, so a sore in your eye. So when your eye is like physically uh, sore, there's, it's, so it so conjures up, at least in my mind, uh, things like it being crusty or pussy, gross, effectively. Right? So it's, it's not aesthetically pleasing to look at. So... Uh, so he's saying this about this particular place. It looks ugly, so it's unesthetic. So what he's doing here, right, is killing a few uh, cognitive and communicative birds with one stone, right? He's packing in a lot of information. I should say, if there's anything that needs expanding or explaining, please put your hand up. And you can, you can definitely butt in during this presentation. It's not a big deal, okay? Please feel free to do so. Uh, so what he's doing here is, is killing several communicative and cognitive birds in one stone, right? He's, he's shifting the idea of military intervention to something that's aesthetic now, right? So we, we don't feel as bad about going in militarily to intervene. He wants to go to war, right? <clears throat> so what it also does is it's altering our representation of Aegina and its people, right? So it's, it's demeaning to the victims at the same time, uh, and it but it presents the attackers, the people who want to intervene as problem solvers. They're gonna help out, right? There's something that needs to be done. So that sort of obligation to, to destroy comes from the fact that we're calling it an eyesore, and an eyesore is something that needs to be dealt with immediately, right? We need, we need to seek some medical help. We need to seek help for that, right? So it does a lot. So I just wanted to show you this to attest to the sort of cognitive, rhetorical, the communicative powers of metaphor. And this is typically how we proceed. Whenever we have to write a paper and submit those sorts of things, we begin with paradigmatic examples and sort of explain them out, okay? <clears throat> okay, so much for our history lesson on uh, metaphor study. It was a lot in a little time. If you permit me to have a sip of water. I'm gonna take my mask off just a little bit. Okay, on to Grice now. <clears throat> so Grice recognized this particular powerful, rhetorically powerful and cognitively uh, replete, um, uh, these aspects or features of metaphor. And he developed this sort of pragmatic account, treating metaphor as a, a species of implicature. Uh, here I take it to be something like uh, pragmatic uh, theories of metaphor will begin from an intuition that in speaking or doing or saying something and uttering something, speakers undertake further complex contents, okay? That they commit themselves to. They're committed to these further contents, 
Okay? <clears throat> now, this basic description that we get from Grice, I mean, he didn't have a lot to say about metaphor. He really didn't. Uh, but what we get from him happens to be in logic and conversation and just a few cursory comments, effectively. Now, just from these cursory comments, we can try and put together a sort of cognitive model. And we have to be careful when we do this. So this, even just this basic description that I provided you implies or naturally seems to suggest a processing model. And I'd like to show you what that processing model looks like. Is this visible for everybody? Yeah, okay. So basically, all of this, this graphic on the, on the right-hand side, can be captured by just these simple compu computational stages on the left here, okay? So this is just uh, the propositional form of the, of the visual, just so you know. So, in, so from uh, Grice's own words on metaphor, there are certain theorists, psycholinguists, who think they can reconstruct it to mean something like this. So this is what I'm going to be calling the psycholinguistic straw man. This I believe to be a caricature of Grice's original intention, or at least some sort of bastardization of it. Okay? So we have stage one. Let's compute the literal meaning of the utterance. We'll call the utterance S here. Uh, this is just standard notation in the literature. Uh, stage two, uh, given contextual or pragmatic input, reject S. Stage three, undergo a search for contextually appropriate alternative meaning. Uh, so we have R, which is going to be defeasible. Uh, but, but is the alternate metaphorical meaning, which is part of a set of different sort of alternatives, all defeasible alternatives. Call those the, the metaphorical content, if you will, okay? <clears throat> okay. So that particular model that I just showed you, the, 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 two, the one, the graphic on the right and the stages on the left there, um, have within them a series of auxiliary hypotheses that Grice was either not committed to or was altogether avoiding. And I want to highlight them all right now, save for two. So on the left here, we have what the, the sort of caricature of Grice. So here we get that the processing of metaphor is serial. So we'll notice that it happened, had to happen in stages. So it's sequential, okay? That the processor always begins from the conventional word meaning, which we can also refer to as literal. I'll use the two terms interchangeably, okay? Always begins from conventional word meaning and proceeds to metaphorical meaning in stages, okay? A la the first principle. That the utterance's conventional meaning facilitates metaphor comprehension. And I'll explain to you why that's bolded and underlined. And then fourthly, that the process is explicitly available. That is to say that it's available to consciousness. I, I'm aware of the stages I'm undergoing as I compute metaphorical meaning, okay? And all speakers are supposed to be. At least this is what psycholing the psycholinguistic model attributed to Grice erroneously says or suggests. Finally, that metaphor processing exerts extra cognitive costs relative to literal control items. Now we're getting a little more technical here, but still this is a lot of import from the psycholinguists who are taking this sort of stance on Grice. So again, this is the caricature of Grice given by psycholinguists. Now what I want to do is preserve three and five. I think there's good grounds to preserve just those two. And if we preserve just those two and we can somehow find a way to get rid of the other three, then we're, prob we're, we're presenting a more charitable sort of interpretation of Grice in the psycholinguistic and neurolinguistic literature. Right? He doesn't fall victim to a, to a straw man, if you will. So this is typically used as a point of, of criticism and departure. So we can refer to this particular model, the straw man, the caricature, as the indirect access model. It's what it's typically referred to in the literature. This is used as a point of departure for direct access models, so direct access theorists. These are people who include contextualist relevance theorists, as well as uh, certain cognitive linguists. Not all from those camps, but for the sake of this, the short time we have to speak, I'll use these as a sort of uh, freely, okay? The direct access model makes the following predictions in terms of metaphor comprehension. So now we're moving away from in the interpretive processes and into comprehension, so into the empirical models. But the processing of metaphor is access first. Now I have a little question mark there because it's not entirely clear if all direct access theorists take this particular or hold this particular uh, theory, but nevertheless. Secondly, that metaphor interpretation is automatic, that this is, happens quickly. That metaphor interpretation exerts no extra cognitive costs relative to literal controls. And I'll try and flesh out what I mean by cognitive costs. And as it turns out, 
when we look into that a little more, right, uh, we, we're in good standing to reject this, this sort of caricature presented of grace. So as we move forward, make sure that we keep in mind that at least three and five I'd like to preserve in a particular model of grace, in a particular psycholinguistic model of grace. <clears throat> that's, that's okay with everybody, okay? Yeah? Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so um, I'd like to discuss some misconceptions with that particular model that we saw, why I think it's a caricature in the first place. Um, <clears throat> so Grice was not really engaged in psycholinguistics at all, in fact, right? That really wasn't what he was looking to do. Uh, he was trying to provide a rational reconstruction. Now, this is well documented, of course. I'm probably telling none of you anything new which is fine, but it does need to be said. Um, what Grice is trying to do, it seems, is when we look at, uh, we're all familiar with, with, with Mars tri-level hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Mars tri-level hypothesis in cognitive science. So, Mar so Mars was a theorist in 1982, wrote a book, it was called, the tri and it, within it he had um, uh, tried to divide different levels in which people can, uh, can look at cognition effectively. So we have computational, algorithmic, and the implementational level. Right? So when we're thinking about the computational level, what we're talking about is the what and the why of a thing. The algorithmic level is going to be how that thing works. So what are the processes or mechanisms for how that works? And implementation is going to be the physical stuff. So we're going to set the implementational thing aside and we're going to try and think about Grice in terms of Mars tri-level hypothesis, those first two levels. So was Grice engaged in considerations of how a process underwent? Or was he more concerned with what and why? Well, the answer to the question is that he was consider more considering what and why. Okay, so he's looking at things from a computational level, not an algorithmic level. Right? Now, there's considerable slack between these two particular levels. But they do constrain each other, of course. Right? There's a two-way street between theory and praxis. But there is considerable amount of slack. So for instance, I mean, uh, we can think about, um, uh, just by way of analogy, um, whether we as people right, uh, judge a syllogism as being valid is immaterial to the question of whether or not that syllogism is actually valid or not. Okay. It's a way to sort of distinguish what I'm trying to do here. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, of course. So whether or not uh, we judge a syllogism in terms of, re I'm just using an analogy, to be valid, right, we as people do, well, that doesn't matter in terms of logic. It's either going to be valid or not. So whether or not we erroneously do it. So I'm saying these are two levels that we're operating at now, right? So this is the sort of the, the, the um, algorithmic level, as we, as we actually process, and then the sort of computational level. So we can think about that sort of analogically, okay? Just to highlight what I'm doing here. Yes? Okay, good, that's more clear. So there are some common misconceptions that are associated with Grice when we don't respect this distinction, right? And so here they are laid out to us. Uh, basically, this comes from Sperber and Wilson, um, Origi and, and uh, Sperber, uh, Karsten, uh, to a certain extent, uh, beside notes, contextualism and relevance theory, okay? We'll hold, Grice to these common, uh, we'll hold Grice accountable to these three things, which I believe to be misconceptions. If we, re, uh, if we reconceive of Grice as operating at the computational level, as opposed to the algorithmic, okay? So we have Grice in pragmatics adopts a mentalistic stance in a sense that is concerned with the internal states and processes underlying interpretation. This is almost verbatim from Wilson, okay? A, a criticism of Grice, which I don't believe stands. These states and processes are available to consciousness. We saw that that was part of the auxiliary hypotheses in the direct access model. And it's way too complicated in reality. Interpretive processes are a lot simpler than Grice would have us believe. Uh, not the case, especially when we're looking at language comprehension in terms of uh, our neural uh, physiology. Uh, things are a lot more complicated, I would argue, uh, than they seem, in fact. Uh, something as simple as vision that we take for granted all the time is, uh, makes use of numerous processes in order for us to provide us with something that seems so simple and easy to do. Okay. 
Okay. So what I'd like to stress is that notwithstanding these, these criticisms here, right, notwithstanding these criticisms, the certain current trend in the literature to, to hold Grice accountable to these things, uh, he doesn't say anything about the specifics of the inferential mechanisms uh, in our minds. So we really have to take care in how we transpose Grice's words on metaphor into the psycholinguistic or empirical domain. Okay. Really trying to beat that point home. <laughs> Okay. I can barely see that. Here, that's easier. Okay. So how do we avoid the Strauman effectively? As I mentioned, uh, we, have to, we have to be aware that Grice was concerned with the computational level, right? That's what he was trying to do. That's, that's the aim of pragmatics in this sense. Um, now, experimental pragmatics is more engaged with the algorithmic level. And again, there is, they do place constraints on one another, <clears throat> but there's considerable lack between them. <clears throat> so if we want to avoid the straw man and make sure that we're respecting this particular distinction, what we can do is reject hypotheses, those auxiliary hypotheses I showed you before of the indirect access model. We can reject one, two, and four, and we're gonna preserve three and five. And I really believe that this follows from uh, Grice's own words on the matter. So here, um, that the utterance is conventional meaning facilitates metaphor comprehension uh, comes to us from a quote that, that uh, Grice gave, right? He was uh, giving an example of a, a particular metaphor. You are the cream in my coffee, right? That's clear to everybody. I take nothing for granted anymore. <laughs> right, and there he says, um, that what you're talking about, what you're mentioning has to possess some of the attributes or resemble those attributes in some way, right? So there's a reliance on the literal there. So we can definitely preserve three. Okay, good. Now five, that metaphor processing exerts extra cognitive costs relative to literal control items. This is something a little trickier, right? To sort of tease out how this, how this came to be uh, or why we want to preserve that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but it does seem to follow from his words nonetheless. So now I'd like to look at just exactly how we understand three and five, or how we could understand them. As it turns out, uh, there is significant backing in the literature to suggest that hypothesis three and five <coughs> um, present a sort of cognitive reality of metaphor processing. So in order to do this, I would just like to uh, contrast the neurophysiological stuff with some of the behavioral stuff that came before. So when we were talking about, which slide am I on, 16? Where is the, here. So when we were talking about uh, the indirect and direct access model, um, the direct access model gets a lot of its support. So a lot of the empirical support comes from behavioral studies. Now, I'm not knocking behavioral studies at all, but the behavioral studies were built on the hypothesis that, or the assumption that, uh, the longer something takes, the more processing is involved, or the more stages are involved. And so that's how they had sort of ruled out this sort of caricature of Grice. So let's just try and unpack this a little bit. So we have a self-paced reading time studies, right? Are we all familiar with these self-paced readings? So we are presented with uh, words on a screen. We press uh, a button, and this moves uh, words on a screen from, uh, to more and more as we, can, as we process what's happening on the screen, right? OK. So we have two conditions, let's say. We have the literal condition and we have metaphor condition. We're presented with a sentence. That sentence is broken up into phrases. So in the literal condition, uh, the soldiers marched forward, let's say. So you would press the thing and it would go through as you understood what was going on. Then that would be measured, right? We'd have a measurement that we could take in terms of time. Then let's do the metaphor. So the dogs marched forward or something. The dogs of war marched forward or something. Now this is not a good experimental these are not good experimental constructs, but just to give you an example. The, um, uh, I don't know. What's a good metaphor for soldiers? Think of one. So let's just say that's the metaphor condition. And so what they're going to do is take the time between both of those and to see if there's any sort of statistical difference between them. If there isn't, well, then we can reject the caricature and uh, the direct access model is, in fact, better. 
because there's no significant difference in reading times between the two conditions. So that's where those studies get their support from. Now there's nothing wrong with that. I do behavioral studies myself. It just happens to be that when we're talking about processing effort, the duration is not the only way we can think about processing effort. We can also talk about the volume of the sorts of nodes that are recruited in processing something. So it may be the case that these two conditions are processed in the same length of time, but maybe the one makes more of different brain regions than the other. So we can think of cognitive cost or exertion in terms of volume instead of duration or temporally, okay? Onwards. Okay, and as a matter of fact, that's exactly what we see in terms of medical research. So I've done a meta-analysis, also done my own pilot stuff and eye tracking and EEG and was hoping to do fMRI when I came here. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But as it turns out, the neurophysiological literature is in fact supportive of the fact that there is more cost exerted in metaphor processing. So in terms of ERP studies, right, this is electric related potentials, right, we see a pronounced N400. Are we all familiar with these terms? Who needs clarity? Should I explain it? Yes? Okay. So an N400 is a negative going waveform. Uh, it's produced, at least in the linguistic literature, in uh, neurolinguistics, psycholinguistics, it's produced whenever we see something that needs to be resolved semantically. Okay? We'll say it. You know, there's a lot more going on, but just for the sake of argument, we'll say it's that, okay? So what we see is a pronounced N400, a negative going wave uh, component in metaphor conditions in comparison to literal controls. So it's enhanced. So there is something going on. So this tells us something about the amount of, of work the brain has to do when we see a metaphor in comparison to the literal control condition. And so I, I cited just a few um, uh, people here that I've read throughout the years uh, and have sort of made it in here <clears throat> that have all concluded this to be the case. And we see it across languages as well. So we know it's not an artifact of one given language. Um, <clears throat> so again, the, the N400 is this, is this component that's associated with a certain semantic space, if you will. So you see the metaphor and as soon as you see it, you're like, oh, oh my, now I have to do something. Now I have to try a little harder than I did before, right? So we see that there's, there's some sort of cost happening here, even though length of time might be the same in terms of comprehension, right? <clears throat> We also have studies done in fMRI research that seem to support the claim that metaphors exert extra costs. Okay. Oh, as a matter of fact, before I get to that, I'd like to mention uh, just one study that was done by, um, that I mentioned up here in German, uh, by Weyland, Schumacher, and Bambini. Now, uh, this study, what it showed, uh, it was one of the only studies to show the reliance of um, metaphorical meaning on the literal. So that the literal meaning does play a facilitating role in metaphor comprehension. So remember that that was hypothesis three, okay? So I, would like, I was backing up hypothesis five here, but I also got to, forgot to mention that hypothesis three is also backed up by this particular research, right? Particularly the one that was done in German. Now, if you want to know how that was the case, I'm gonna have to start drawing stuff on here. Uh, and we'll do that in the question period, okay? But I can explain to you the, the sort of setup they had uh, an RSVP setup uh, in, a, in mass priming study. So I can show you all of that afterwards if you're interested. Take it from me, they back it up, okay? Uh, turning to the fMRI research, um, how many of us are familiar with fMRI research? Are we good with areas of the brain? Show of hands, oh, we're okay. I'm sort of novice, but. Okay, so we have uh, fMRI, which is showing that we have uh, higher activation in certain regions. And I wanna look at each one of those regions just uh, individually, <clears throat> not giving too much time to them, but just to highlight exactly what they're supposed to be doing, right? Now, what the fMRI does, for those of us who aren't familiar, is that it takes advantage of uh, blood flow, blood and oxygen. Okay, so there's sort of the self-regulation of blood flow in the brain already. And what happens is that uh, and there's in variation between different regions that are active is so small and minuscule, you wouldn't be able to tell. But 
as certain regions are active, more oxygen is taken to those regions. And what fMRI is able to do is sort of take uh, advantage of that particular flow, right? Now that was in a very simple, simple way, try and sum that up. So we'll move on. If you have any problems with that, we can discuss that later. Um, so what we seem to see, as a matter of fact, is significant amount of activation in certain areas that play very interesting roles in, uh, in our um, communicative and uh, social lives more generally. Right, so suggesting that we could not get rid of hypothesis five, suggesting that in fact we can that we can support the fifth hypothesis. In fact, the fifth hypothesis that we saw earlier on that I wanted us to keep in mind, right, in terms of uh, Grice's model or his theory of metaphor, doesn't even go far enough. Right, so this gives us more insight actually as to what's happening. So here we see we have. Um, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activated, uh, the left supramarginal uh, gyrus, the visual cortex, the left uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We have the left temporal pole, which is the anterior region of the temporal lobe. Uh, and we have the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, all activated here. And I've had just different slices of the brain to show you, okay? Okay, what the hell does that mean? We can unpack that a little bit. When we're looking at the right and left uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, I'm just going to see DLPC, uh, FC, okay? And the cingulate gyrus, this is, uh, so what, what these are for, executive demands uh, set by tasks. So these are things we have to draw our attention to, right? So this is things like working memory uh, and, and attention retrieval and seeking. Uh, we have the processing of literal language that's happening uh, in these areas, uh, especially the left side. Uh, we have activation in uh, the visual and verbal memory tasks, we, uh, which maintains high demands of conflict revolution, or re uh, resolution, excuse me. We see this in the Stroop task. Is anybody, everybody familiar with the Stroop task? It's where you write uh, the name of a color. So say I write red, but I do it in green, and I ask you to name, like, what is the color of the marker? You, you have to, like, try and figure. It's, it's quite difficult, as a matter of fact. Uh, so we see that it maintains high demands of conflict resolution. So it does this, these areas uh, together. Um, which means that we see that there's some competing going on here, right, between the concepts that are being used in, in when we deploy a metaphor. And we have to try and resolve something. There's conflict happening. It's sort of metaphorical itself. How nice. We have uh, in social cognition, these areas are recruited uh, for social perspective taking, inferring intentions, okay. uh, theory of mind, cognitive flexibility, working memory and language comprehension. Um, <clears throat> the left SMG is a multimodal associative uh, sort of area. So it takes in various oh, multimodal information, of course. It seems self-explanatory. Uh, but it's interesting because it's not only um, this sort of gatekeeper between um, the, uh, the uh, auditory stuff, right? We think it's for typically. But not necessarily, it also takes in a lot of visual stimuli as well. And it redirects it to different modules in the brain. So we see that this is overactive here, right? Perhaps when we have a particularly apt metaphor, we have to think about it imagistically in a certain way, perhaps in another way. Maybe hold the object in our minds, something like that, okay? Uh, the visual cortex, interestingly enough, uh, is, is more activated in these tasks. Um, this is most likely given higher demands on the metaphorical mapping. Right? So when we have to think through a poetic metaphor, right? tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, really got to think about these sorts of things, right? Shakespeare, by the way. Um, then we have the, uh, the right uh, VLPFC. This is inhibition response. Right? So this is the ability to stop a task and direct our attention to something else. Uh, it's also responsible for long-term memory retrieval, so information, encyclopedic information, or perhaps episodic information from uh, times past that, bring, bring, that you need to bring to bear on the interpretive process. Okay. Uh, also, the retrieval of that, well, that has to be relevant information. You have to search for what's relevant in understanding a metaphor. And all this is happening quite quickly. Okay? But it's not as simple as, as Wilson would make it seem. Finally, it's uh, responsible for abstracting. Okay, that's good because I'm on my penultimate slide. Excellent. 
So, just putting this together right now, we see that Grice was stressing a theory of metaphor, not a model of metaphor, a theory of one. Now, whenever we try and think about uh, theories in terms of uh, testability, right, we're naturally going to make some auxiliary hypotheses. That's, that's going to happen. That's necessarily the case when we go from a model of competence to a model of performance, right? So what I say is that we can interpret Grice's words in those ways that I presented to you with hypothesis three and five. We can preserve those two. And in fact, the literature seems to support it. Actually, it would be more accurate to say the literature even goes past it, right? So Grice was, uh, on the theoretical side of things, he was interested in thinking about metaphor as that communicatively powerful, rhetorical, and cognitive tool. He believes that uh, metaphors carry cognitive import. Whether or not they can be tested empirically, I think, is besides the point. Uh, it's probably more a job for, the, for philosophy. On the empirical side of things, though, he did stress the importance of conventional word meaning, what we call literal word meaning. And he stressed the, import, the, uh, uh, the idea that metaphor is, in fact, a little more, exerts cognitive costs. Right? It's a little more costly to interpret a metaphor than it would be a literal utterance, let's say. Now, what he did not do was specify patterns of thought on which metaphor comprehension rests. Those things that speakers use and the things that those sorts of patterns of thought that, uh, that hearers themselves have to exploit. Thanks for telling me, guys. You're all implicated in this. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, and finally, uh, what he didn't do was he didn't specify all the other things that we're seeing that have arisen out of the fMRI research especially. And this would be the, those, that's, uh, the non-cognitive stuff, all the other stuff that seems to be happening, right? The effect of the evocative, the poetic, these sorts of things that are all involved in interpreting a metaphor. And that's what I have for you today. And I think I've ended pretty well within 45 minutes. <laughs> hey, right on time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. The points of the? In the, the uh, underwrite access model, oh, yes. you rejected uh, several points. Yeah. But you rejected that you start from the conventional, conventional meaning. So how would it work? Interesting. So this is something I don't think Grice really speaks of. Um, from his words, we were given the, the indirect access model, which is se sequential, right? It's a serial process model. Um, it's quite almost nearly universally accepted that things don't happen that way. I would surmise that it's parallel processing. So we have these sorts of syntactical semantic processes happening uh, bottom up. At the same time, we have these pragmatic contextual inferring people's beliefs and these sorts of things happening top down. And this is working in tandem. So I don't think we necessarily need to begin with the conventional meaning of the word. Now, the conventional meaning is definitely going to help us sort of identify uh, which sorts of pieces of pragmatic information that we want to keep and which ones would be uh, irrelevant. No. No, so, so those two points, she was asking about if, if it's not serial, then what is it? If it's not serial processed, how, how could it be pro Yeah, if it doesn't start from the moment. Yeah, that was... So if it's not processed sequentially, how would it be processed? And the answer would be probably almost nearly universally, everybody agrees it'd be something like parallel processing. I mean, there's even uh, a movement right now. There's a theory that's been presented quite recently, uh, even in language comprehension, which follows the analogy of the, um, the visual pathway. So we have the uh, dorsal and the ventral stream, this sort of bifurcated stream, whenever we're hearing things. Well, we're using this for language now, too. So we think language has a sort of ventral and a dorsal stream as well. I mean, so parallel processing seems to be the way the brain works. Not to say that it's not organized in sort of these discrete ways as well, 
but definitely that these, these things are happening. Uh, there's a, there's a multi-network of things going on all at once. That'd be my answer. I wouldn't attribute that to Grice, although it would be compatible with him, with his, with his theory, given that he wasn't interested in speculating about the algorithmic level. Mm -hmm. okay. But does it have any evidence against the other model? That's, that's my curious thing. So I haven't found any. No. Uh, does it have any evidence against Grice? No, no, against the Tyrek model. So it shows that the Gracia model uh, could be. Oh, right. Adopt, yeah. But does it show that the Tyrek model has been problem or just. This is precisely. Remember what I was saying to everybody? If you guys are interested in hearing about this RSVP mass priming thing, this is exactly that study. So this is the study that would work against the direct access model. Okay, so there is. So there, there, there is. There, there is. Yeah, and that would be the one that I've highlighted there. Okay. Yeah. Of course. As a matter of fact, it is not. Oh. So uh, what's tucked away in behind all of this stuff here, oh. uh, like in the larger paper, uh, is that uh, is showing all of the different ways in which um, all the different sorts of metaphors that we have. Okay. Uh, so these studies are not just exploring noun, noun. So when we think of metaphors, we think of a noun as a noun, mm -hmm. right? Bill is a bulldozer kind of thing, you know what I mean? Uh, but these studies explore different sorts of syntactic constructs for, for metaphors, um, adverbial metaphors, um, ver verbal metaphors, these sorts of things. It also looks at um, the sort of time, the l life scale of a metaphor. There's a particular theory out there, it's called the career of metaphor hypothesis. Uh, it states that metaphors begin with, uh, begin uh, sort of spectacularly, right? Uh, they're, they're very poetic. The meanings aren't easy to get. And then as we familiarize ourselves with them, uh, the familiarity makes them conventional. And when, they, when they're conventionalized, then we perhaps have a stock of information that we can uh, seek from. We can still use them differently in different contexts, but they're taken typically to mean the same thing. When you call somebody a shark, for instance, uh, you're, you're saying that they're perhaps cunning, something to be respected, but also feared, right? So this would be a conventional sort of metaphor. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have idioms. Now, these studies, all of them will be exploring metaphors across this, this entire continuum. And they found in each one of those conditions, minus idioms, that there was some sort of enhanced uh, N400. Yeah. Sorry to bore everybody. <laughs> Okay. Oh. I have a question about uh, the sources for attributing crisis any view at all. It's just this, it's just this paragraph in the, in the logic and conversation paper. About metaphor? That, that, you know, it's just one paragraph after irony, that's a metaphor, and that's all, or we have anything else. I mean, because I found it a little bit, I don't know, Reading too much into Rice to, to summarize it that, well, he stressed the cognitive aspect of metaphor. Okay, okay. do you say so? Uh, I just remember the <laughs> example, and you know. Let's think of. Of course, the speaker is not believing in this, in this case, you know, uh, that is one is trivial, blah, 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 so there is some other thing. Right. The speaker wants to convey. So to read there a processing model or not, a serial model or not, or anything like it seems like move too much, right? Unless yeah. you have, I don't know, more hints of, of just here and there. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's my first May I respond to that with two? Oh, yeah, yeah. May I make two responses? 
So on the first hand, you can think about Grice here in terms of uh, how we think about metonymy. You know, when we use the word uh, Kleenex, we're referring to tissue paper. So Grice here is, when I, when I use the word Grice, what I'm referring to are pragmatic theories. So early pragmatic theories. So even here, we got Grice, who's, uh, and people who've developed Grice, a Gricean sort of picture. We have Martinic, Camp, uh, Searle, for instance. These would all be pragmatic views. <laughs> Secondly, so we can think about Grice sort of metonically in this sense. So again, like Kleenex stands for tissue paper, Grice stands for pragmatic theories. We can think about it that way. Uh, secondly, don't forget that Grice's theory of metaphor falls from his theory of implicature. And there's a shit ton of literature on that, right? So I mean, and he's really ushered in this, this idea that we can try and uh, understand implicature uh, in, in terms of a processing model. I mean, it, it naturally, it's unabashedly psychologically latent, right? His, the, the terms he employs. So I think we, what, what we should do is actually be careful when we do that. I think what you're saying is we should be cautious, but there might not be enough there. Well, in terms of the fact that metaphor is a part of a species of implicature for Grice, I mean, we should just be careful what we say about what he has to say about the empirical dimension. And so this is mostly a, a way to be, to steer clear of that. So I, I understand your, 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 uh, your worry, but Right. Yeah. No, and I, I would and I would argue that they're not. I would argue that they're not, in fact. Yeah. Maybe what I say is not within what you were talking today, but what, and as far as I understood, all these studies uh, are looking at the here, here perspective. So what happens in the here? In the oh, yeah, here, yes. A metaphor, no? So it seems to be a, a process that is unconscious and a bunch of many things happen at the same time. I understood what? But my question is, is there any study, we study the perspective of the one who produces the metaphor? Because in some cases, it's a conscious process. So maybe as a producer, I can't think that the other person is doing a similar process as I am doing when I'm producing the metaphor. So I, I was just wondering. Something. Wonderful question, actually, yeah. Um, we sort of reverse engineer what metaphor is based on the, uh, the epistemology of the, of the hearer, right? Uh, that'd be very interesting. Actually, yeah, that's, that's great. I'm going to write that down, in fact. Uh, no, there hasn't been. Uh, at least so, to my knowledge, I haven't seen anything like that. Uh, it would be kind of difficult, in fact. Uh, if you're going to do an fMRI, you have to be very, very still, right? So to start speaking and stuff, it would have to be very... It'd be an interesting study, because even uh, when you're looking at EEGs, you have to be very still, right? Yeah. When it, all my participants have to just sit there for four hours like this, you know what I mean? So it'd be hard to have somebody producing speech and then also tapping into what's going on. But as technology increases, so will our sort of tools of analysis, right? I can imagine there. What thinking about that? You mentioned that sometimes at the beginning of a metaphor, the metaphor for the people to interpret the, the the metaphor is like quite novel and they have to do a lot of effort. And when the time passed, the metaphor is just conventional. So it's kind of more easy. So uh, probably when you are producing a metaphor for the first time, uh, you put a lot of effort in producing it. Of course, the other people will say, Yeah. Hey, I want. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, uh, it, I mean, there hasn't been anything done, but there are some sort of uh, methodological limitations. And I, that's why I suspect they're not having uh, these sorts of things. 
But at the same time, I, uh, I try and steer clear of making these sorts of ontological claims about metaphor. I, I do like to stick with the epistemological stuff and then sort of use that as a means to understand the sort of patterns of thought that, uh, that um, the hearer has to use, but that the speaker also exploits and expects the hearer to use. So I, I just go with Grice on that matter. And that, that's as, as far as my reasoning goes in that case. But I, yeah, I think it's, as uh, I have some friends who actually who have, um, who have just created uh, back home, this is in the States, um, a um, EEG machine, like a mobile one for, for concussions. So it's just a matter of time before, so you can be able to walk around and still get readings and everything. Uh, but it's just a matter of time before we have technology that's able to withstand the, all the artifacts that are produced when you are moving around while you're in these, in these machines, right? A lot of artifacts are produced. It's, it, it, it can be bad, at least in terms of EEG research. Yes? Uh, well, uh I was thinking because when you mentioned the areas in the brain that were activated uh, with the fMRI, um, you were mentioning that, uh, for example, the visual uh, part was activated or the auditorial uh, part was activated. But um, does it depend on the kind of metaphor? Like if, for example, you say something that uh, is thunder or something that activates. Um, yeah, that is sound related, it activates the auditorial part of the brain, or is all the same for? To an extent, yes. So what I showed you was a meta-analysis. It was a bunch of different studies that were superimposed onto one another. So what I presented was just across the studies. Uh, but individual studies themselves will show that there are going to be, it depends on how imagistic the metaphor is. Um, for instance, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his last hour upon the stage. Like how do, we, you know what I mean? We're gonna do a lot of processing and that's gonna happen in a certain region as opposed to hearing Bill's a bulldozer, right? But the, the point is, is that there is activation happening in these areas. Not all, all of these areas are activated with every metaphor, no. That was just a sort of meta-analysis. Uh, meta-analysis, this is a transposition of many different studies. But good, but good question for point of clarity for sure. Yes. Um, I don't think it's a question, a suggestion, I don't know, um, or a criticism. I don't know. <gasps> no, I don't it's know. probably a criticism. Just like the beginning, right? You you distinguish between conventional meaning yeah. and uh, metaphorical meaning, and and you insist in that. Well, you said that uh, according to these people, Grice is stressing the, the role of conventional meaning, right? But, but I think it's much more complex. Right? And, uh, and it's much more, you know, or it, it asks for more detail, like, you know, classical distinctions like conventional meaning and content of the utterance. Uh, I mean, Grice does that, that's for sure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In this case, it was made as it was asserted. Yeah, make, right. make as if, right. right. But but you can do, I mean, look, the example of Aristotle was good because even if you understand the conventional meaning of it, you, you're sore, if you don't understand the, the reference of the initial right. uh, uh, proper name, then the, you don't get the content, then you don't get the metaphorical one. But there might be cases right. which it's enough to identify the place and know something about the place. Right. To understand, no, I mean, to understand the metaphorical term or the meaning of the metaphorically used term uh, without understanding the conventional yeah. meaning. I don't know exactly what the philosopher is, but I sort of understand the metaphor, or I think I understand some part of the metaphor in this touchstones or whatever. When I read touchstones talking about uh, Frank, he's a good philosopher. I mean, I don't know, something like a big tank, a big machine or something, so that's enough. I don't know. So there, there, there must be a lot of combinations depending on, first, what's the metaphorical, I mean, some, most of the times, as you said, it's a term, or I still said, right? Yeah. It's a term. It is being 
this is metaphorical. It's not the whole sentence or the whole article, but it's just a term or, or a constituent of the sentence which is being metaphorically used. And then you can have several combinations of uh, getting the metaphorical meaning without getting the conventional meaning, but just knowing something about the reference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, but that doesn't help, right? Uh, because it, it's not everything that I use, the proper name. Or you are defending my coffee. You is used non metaphorically. Yeah. And knowing something about what's talking about the right. health of what, what the hell means being the king of the coffee, because I, I never understood that it was a made up of name. <laughs> <laughs> That little added bonus you get. Yeah, is there one part which is good in this coffee of English coffee? Fair enough. Yeah. I guess so. Well, it has to be something like, like uh, you are my my sugar cube, the sugar cube in my heart. Did you hear that? You heard that? You are the sugar cube in my heart. Thank you. <laughs> That's the equivalent, the corresponding metaphor yeah. in Basque. And you know what? There, there is a little bit of this that I have to play with in my, in my work, but uh, not much because what, what depends on conventional meaning is going to be speaker to speaker, culture to culture. What, what counts as a conventional metaphor, as you just showed it, as I just learned. Uh, not just learned, but. Um, you know, when you, when you take a conventional metaphor from one community of, uh, of language users who speak a particular language, take it to another, it's not going to be conventional, right? It might not. Uh, so conventionality of metaphor and what con is what, what's considered to be conventional in terms of semantics, I mean, is something that's going to be, it's, it would be so difficult to try and pin down what that means. Because I think it, would, it just varies. It would vary with the particular linguistic community. Whether or not you've, uh, you've read any of the stuff by Aristotle talking about Pericles or of um, Aegean and, and, the, and the port, which still exists to this day, by the way. Still a very busy port in Greece. Do you think it's something like Christian uh, oh. historical meaning or something like that? I don't know what exactly means, but I rely on previous speakers, right? Yeah. I learned I learned this metaphor from someone. I took it to mean something, or well, if I'm not, if I'm wrong, right. I mean to mean what they say, or something like that. Something like that. It'd be interesting to think of. I've I, never, I've never put the two. Example, two. example in Spanish, uh, you have Pedro Daniel and Sapos, and nobody knows what Nini and there means. Whether it's zero, or whether it means. Uh, the iris in your eye. Oh. So, so people usually. <laughs> uh oh. Huh? You did it again. Stirred it up. There's a king. Let me know. Let me know. Let me know. That's what you mean. I guess. But you can't say that, right? No. Yeah. My question to the students was: was can I say to a boy? Can I say to a boy to the king and so forth? And they say no. Okay. All right. Maybe you can. I don't know. I think like on, on you know the authors of the 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 we, we don't have to know what the etymological history is. We don't even know the literal meaning anymore, like kicking the bucket, for instance, right? Just w I, for English speakers who are familiar with the idiom or people who are familiar with the idiom in general, kicking the bucket just means to die, right? And you just process that immediately. There, there's, no, there's no physical kicking of a bucket. When you say he kicked the bucket, you're just like, holy, oh my God, really? Like you're surprised because someone just died. That's what you've been told. So, yeah. 
maybe idioms or idiomatic expressions might shed light on this particular example. No, exactly, precisely, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.